So thank you, Diana, for inviting me. Uh, I missed David's uh, presentation and also June, so I believe that we all discussed the same things. Um, but I will give a different angle. I will also speak about a third country, which is Israel. How, any of you guys been to Israel? One. Okay, so that's good. Two. Oh, three. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a small country, right? Um, okay, so let's start. Um, that's my Chinese background. I don't know what it's written there, so don't take it for granted. Um, but basically, um, as Diana said, I was involved with investments over the years, um, been a lot in China, and found China as one of the biggest potential for Israeli and U.S. tech. I, I am a great believer in in cross-bordering, I think this is the biggest potential when you go out of your comfort zone. Um, and um, we have done uh, also investments in China. Um, we sold one company to Huawei. And, um, and Rhodium itself, which is, next slide. Uh, I think we have a problem there. So, uh, wait one second. So, Rhodium is just not a typical uh, investment fund. It's not a fund per se. It's a family office that is an Israeli family office that controlled about a third of the Israeli economy for many years. Uh, the family invested in, also in China. They were the first uh, institutional investors in a fund called Infinity. They are GPs in Infinity. Infinity was one of the first um, global funds to invest in, in China, mainly in China. Uh, we have invested in, in hundreds of companies and unicorns. Uh, most notable in the past years is uh, uh, Mobili. Mobili is a company that was acquired by Intel for $15 billion. Um, but also many others. They were the first investors in the Israeli VCs and tech. Um, we are now investing for the first time from a fund per se, not only from the family. And, and China is definitely, we saw it as a potential partner for that fund. Um, okay, so we have some blinking screen, I think. Israel is a startup nation. You know the word Utah. So it's a Utah nation. Um, it's a small, it's a small country. Um, we need to find a way. Can you just? So Israel, it's, it's a small country. Uh, yeah, so the three people who've been to Israel, they, you know the numbers. But how many people live in Israel? Do you know how many Israelis, Jewish people, are there in the world? Okay, close. There are lots of people who say 100, 200 million. So the truth is that we are really very small uh, group of people. And in Israel, there are only 8 million um, people all over. And, and I can, can tease it so you can just uh, go to the next slide. Okay, then we'll work from here. So th those are some facts about Israel, but let's, let's continue. Just to let you know that Israel has more sushi restaurants per capita than any other country in the world. <laughs> it has more museums per capita than any other country in the world. And when I say per capita, it's the, the key thing, because when a country is only 8 million, per capita is the main issue, right? So just remember after this meeting, that Israel and China together is 1.3 billion people, okay? So let's continue to the next one. Okay. No? Thank you. So, um, so no. Working now? Yeah. Okay. So, so this is a map of, uh, of 
Tel Aviv area, which is the, the main business center in Israel. This is most of just map of companies that are, uh, that are uh, in the same place. The density is very, very high in Israel. And the feeling is very similar to Silicon Valley. Anywhere you go, there's high tech. People either establish a startup, dream of a startup, close a startup, sell the startup. So it's very, very living, kicking environment of innovation. Uh, and, and the numbers also show it. Those are numbers are not accurate because in the past two years, we were talking about three companies a day in a small country. Uh, and, and some of the reasons for that is because Israel, though it's very small, it's still producing uh, lots of research in academia and investments in uh, global investments in R&D and local investments in R&D. And this eventually turns to be a very innovative hub. Um, people ask us, how come it happens in Israel? How come it didn't happen uh, uh, somewhere else? So Israel is very similar to Silicon Valley. The whole value chain uh, is, is existing in Israel as an ecosystem. So if you see, the whole blockchains are there. So there's Israeli military who creates a lot of uh, uh, graduates who come from special units. There's a very strong academy. There's a very strong uh, global uh, multinational companies operating in Israel. They acquire the companies, establish new R&D centers, the VCs invest in them, the startups are being formed. So all the, the ecosystem all the time feeds itself. Um, we are now at Stanford, so just to give you a, a, you know, a, a perspective, Tel Aviv University, um, the Rekanatis are the founders of the business school, is ranked number nine. Uh, in the most innovative uh, faculties. Again. I think you just need to change uh, to replace the batteries. So those are the, those are the global uh, companies operating in Israel. There are about 350 of them. This is 290 still. Um, we see some of Chinese corporate uh, uh, um, active in Israel. Um, Huawei, that I mentioned before, established their R&D center based on, on our company. But Alibaba and Tencent and all those are, are also active in Israel. And Tencent, by the way, that was mentioned before, uh, was based, the WeChat was, uh, the, was based on Israeli company called ICQ. So we have a stronger fund than I have. So those are some of the funds that are active in Israel. And Israel many times is described like another state in the US because our culture is so close to, to America. So if, if Israel was a state in the US, it would be ranked number four after New York and, uh, and Silicon Valley and New England. So let's talk about trying. Okay. So um, the potential is huge. Um, I think the, the biggest potential is how to bring most innovative products to China. China currently has its own development of things. We see a lot of things in AR and VR and AI, but China doesn't have the access to the most innovative products because the product, in a lifetime, the first years of a product is limited for one, one market. A startup can go and multiply uh, markets. It can go only to one market, and the easiest market for them to penetrate is the U.S. market. And how we can change it? What, what, what can make China have the access to see those products before they move to the U before they, they go to the U.S. market? So I, I think there are ways to convince American and Israeli companies to penetrate the Chinese market instead of the U.S. market first. But for that, you need a few, few things. You need a, a very strong market fit. It means that when you compare the two markets, China is for sure a better market for that company. And the ROI for the investor would be much higher. The penetration would be much better. You also need good partners. One of the things that I was mentioned before is security and, and trust. And uh, from all the companies that I speak with and many investors that I speak with in, in China, always there's a feeling that you, you don't have those two elements. 
Um, when a startup company is betting on, on a partner, it can be crucial for its existence, right? If you pick the wrong partner in China, it can kill you. So we need to build those kind of trustable relationship that will lower the fear that we have in, in partnership. Another thing that can help with that is funding. So if you have a good source of funding coming from China to support this kind of penetration to the Chinese market, then it's helpful. And this also can help for the IP protection because one of the biggest fears for, um, for companies who are not from China is that someone will take their IP and will use it in China. So if we have those mechanisms together, then we can protect ourselves when we want to penetrate the Chinese market. We have Chinese investors who want you to succeed. They will be your partner. They will help you. And they will protect your IP. We have a better market fit, so we have a reason to go there. And we have, and we have a way to do it. The last thing is the one that I will discuss uh, later, is the hybrid partners. So you probably know it. There's a big cultural gap between the West and the East. And me as an Israeli with this Israeli accent, I feel it all the time when I look at you guys from the side. But there are things that we don't understand when, you go, when we go to do business uh, in China. And there are things that Chinese don't understand when we are trying to do business with Americans. Um, and, and it's always how to get to the win-win situation. So if we look at this triangle, um, so I believe that Silicon Valley is still the center of everything. This is where you can try your technology, you can try the market, you can get the feedback from the market. You have the best minds who already have the experience. The whole ecosystem works seamlessly. When we look at Israel and China, so at any given moment, even now, what time is it? No, just kidding. Uh, there are delegations of uh, Chinese investors who come to Israel to look for, for technology. There are delegations of companies looking for partnerships in Israel. But the amount of deals that are actually done and the amount of deals that actually can be uh, meaningful is very, very small. The culture gap between in the business area and the culture gap between what people in China are looking for and what the Israeli companies supply is huge. And the only way to solve it, in my idea, is working with hybrid people. So just as Diana is someone who understands very well the culture here in the US, in Silicon Valley, but also understands very well the culture in China. People like me and other people who understand the culture in Israel, in Silicon Valley, are the ones that can bridge. We need those bridge people, and it can come from Silicon Valley. The people who were exposed to different cultures, they know how to understand the Chinese culture, at the same time they don't know how to understand the Israeli culture. When we try to do it directly, it mostly fails. Uh, so China is very active everywhere in the world. We see them very active around here, but they're also very active in Israel. Uh, some of the largest acquisitions that have been done in Israel in the past years with, were made by uh, Chinese uh, groups. Um, the side of Huawei, we are talking about Alibaba, we are talking about, um, we are talking about uh, Tencent and others, but we are also talking about fundamentals of the Israeli economy, insurance companies, we are talking about uh, diaries, we are talking about the lots of things who are part of the fundamentals of the Israeli economy, not only tech. So, what do I think will happen ahead of us? Um, it's not so clear, but, but the way I look at it is America is starting to defend its, uh, its IP. So we start to see more and more clash between um, who owns technology, who will dominate technology. Um, I think America for a long time was sleeping while China was developing amazing technology. And right now in mobile, fintech, AI, robotics, we see a lot of things happening in China that are more advanced even than the US. 
So this gap is narrowing. Uh, still, America is stronger in space, and still stronger in automotive, it's still stronger in a semiconductor. And I think America will start to defend itself from having those IP leak into Chinese companies. And this will create some kind of a clash. Th that's my feeling from conversation I have with people. And in, in that clash of, of titans, Israel is, is a third party. Israel is, is a small boat. Is not has no do, those kind of fears. We don't. We are not too big to fight those fights, but we are big enough to not to be ignored. So, um, so this is one of the biggest potential of the Israeli tech. And I think now with the new regulations in China that enables to invest in tech, it will be an interesting time for those companies and those technologies to partner. Um, so this is the potential that they see. Those are all the sectors, but there are so many other things. We, we talk about agriculture. We talk about automotive. We talk about so many different areas where Chinese uh, companies, well, usually the bigger one, and Israeli companies can penetrate, can, can partner. And you know everything here is things that you know by heart, but if you find the right partners, this is the crucial part to do it the right way. And and find the right market fit. Um, I'm trying to tell those Israeli companies in my portfolio and others, look for the market fit. Um, recently, we, there was an article in TechCrunch about one of our portfolio companies that just raised another $60 million in the battery area. And for me, for example, China is probably one of the best markets for that kind of companies. That's it. So thank you very much.